You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. Be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q U I K S T R I K E One. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. Welcome back to TWIFO, the program where pretty much the name says it all. We look back at the week that was and indeed still is on the other side of the fence, the futures options side of the fence. Maybe we'll talk a little bit of eggs. Maybe we'll talk some metals, maybe some equity, some crude. You never know what's going to make it on the show. That's why you have to tune in every week. We talked some eggs recently. We got even into weird stuff like it, like some of the some of the lean hogs product. I think we even talked dairy a while back. So all sorts of fun stuff makes it on rates. You never know what's going to be on the show. Tune in every week, Thursday, 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. My name is Mark Longo. If I sound a little bit different, because I'm coming at you from our southern studio today, not back in Chicago, which is why if you were listening live, I know there's been some issues on the Mixler front, so hopefully that'll be all be sorted out. You guys can join us live again soon. But in the meantime, live to tape here on the old TWIFO program. You guys know how to get at us. Send us your questions, your comments, your insights. We do. Yes, indeed, we do. 
love to hear from you guys. I also love to be hearing from this guy. I'm very happy to say I'm joined once again on the program. He's been traveling the earth, quite literally the earth, since the last time we we saw him. And now he's, I think, back in Chicago, and I'm back here in the Southern studio. So we're still not in the same time zone, but I'm pleased to be joined once again by Mr. Sean Smith, the Managing Director of Derivatives Licensing over there at FTSE Russell. Mr. Smith, welcome back to the show. It has been too long, sir. It's great to be back. It's great to be back in Chicago. Almost. The weather here is <laughs> awful. I hear it's a little chilly over there. Summer summer has not has not arrived yet, and uh, hopefully it does soon, not only for me, but for our farmers as well. So Yeah. You know, I hear I, I, I might trade what you have for us here in the Southern Studio, because it's nice here. It's about, you know, 80 some odd degrees and sunny, but then the rain comes. And then it's just like you're in the Amazon basin for several hours. So I don't know. Maybe I would trade what you have for a little bit of this. I guess the grass is always literally greener, sir, right? Wherever you are not, that's where the weather is better. That is so true. So true. But give us a quick rundown. Where the heck have you been over the last month? You've been all over the place, right? Yeah, I've done some traveling. We uh, most recently, uh, Footsie Russell hosted for our our partners and clients a – uh, an annual World Investment Forum, and it was down in uh, Palmetto Bluff, South Carolina, South Carolina, which is just outside of Savannah, Georgia. And it's this uh, magnificent part of the world. Uh, I have to say that uh, our conference was fantastic. There was lots of, uh, of discussion about the, the global economy. We had uh, host, we, we hosted uh, some, some really good speakers. Uh, Blue Putnam, the chief economist of the CME, who has has been on your show several times. Never heard of Speaker, him. Terrible person. This, this fine young gentleman named Tim McCourt, who's uh, head of equities and alternative investments for CME Group, and Rob Hawking, who heads up global derivative strategy for SIBO Global. Uh, we're on a panel together uh, discussing uh, markets and conditions and 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 how to uh, how to how to trade through event type driven scenarios all all in uh, kind of dessert from the entree that Blue Putnam served prior to to their panel. So standing room only for uh, for, for the uh, discussions uh, and the rest of the uh, panels were absolutely relevant and timely. Uh, great discussion our, our customers and, and clients and uh, partners had just a fantastic time. The weather was kind of iffy kind of as it is where you are it rained quite a bit but uh it didn't didn't stop us from having a, some extracurricular activities outside uh which made it just all that much more enjoyable with with our clients and partners so sounds like you've been partying it up re- since the last time i saw you sir <laughs> that's where i've been recently now i would say there was a good balance of uh work and bonding with our clients let's put it that way so yeah it was actually a lot of fun and uh uh, and, and a lot of value uh, was brought to, to to everyone that participated. So, compliments to to our, our hosts, uh, our folks at at FTSE also that hosted this for our clients and did all the work. Our, our event planners, that would be uh, uh, Lynn Sims and Laurel Manning. They're both uh, just fabulous people and just really knocked the cover off the ball in terms of just doing everything so that <laughs> everybody had that special experience. So. I don't know. It uh, sounds like it might be a good a good location for a future Twifo next year. I'm just putting it out there. Sounds like it might be a good one. I'm I'm telling you, this place was amazing. Like I, I have not experienced a little uh, a little uh, community like this uh, resort that we were at. It was absolutely fantastic. Twifo live from the FTSE Russell Con. Let's call it 20, uh, 2020. <laughs> Put it on your calendars now. Well, the re- there's a reason you're joining me today, Sean. I, I, as much as I do like and get jealous from you regaling us with all your recent events you've been to, uh, but there is a reason you're joining us. It's that time of year, sir. It's recon time. It's one of the biggest. In fact, I'm hard pressed to think of a bigger equity driving volume event than Russell Recon. It kind of is the the biggest game in town in terms of singular events that will just drive a ridiculous amount of volume in a short period of time. It's coming up. We are on the precipice, sir. I know you've been talking about this a lot in the over there in Russell offices and at your event and uh, traveling to various clients. And this has been taking up a lot of your a lot of your brain power of late, Sean. So give us an update. How are things going in in recon land? And, and what are you hearing from the clients and people as we approach this pretty pretty monumental event for the equity space? You know, it's uh, it's that annual rebalance of Russell U.S. indexes that uh, you know keeps us relevant with our investors. It's uh, 
It's a reconstitution that happens every year in June. Um, it, uh, it, it's just an important part of keeping the, the Russell U.S. index indexes relevant to the marketplace. So this really uh, is an important tool for investors. Um, uh, just, you know, these, the, the market cap and tiers and, and style designs all have to uh, stay relevant. Um, and I'm actually kind of quoting Ralph Agatha a little bit. He's the guy that uh, is our in-house expert on, on Russell indexes. But uh, it's, uh, it's an important thing that happens every year where uh, we rebalance those indexes and, and keep them where they are relevant to the marketplace. Speaking of relevance, I got, I do have, oh, I'm sorry. Go I ahead. Do go have ahead. To say, I, I, just to add, last year um, there was what 97, 98 billion dollars of notional value that tra- transacted in the last second uh, milliseconds of trading on New York Stock Exchange and Nasdaq, and uh, you know that that closing cross mechanism at Nasdaq last year, 1.88 billion shares traded in those in that last moment of trading on nasdaq last year and um you know it it was a record record volume so we're looking for somewhere along the same type of numbers this year yeah like like i was saying we're trying to Oh, go ahead. No, I'm saying in terms of planned events in the marketplace, you know, obviously the unplanned events, massive sell-offs and things, they could generate a lot of volume. But in terms of planned events in the marketplace, I'm hard-pressed to think of anything that could really rival uh, the Russell Recon. It's in terms of driving that much volume in a short period of time, I'm, it pretty much stands alone, I think. It really does. It does. And uh, um, I will actually be at uh, uh, NASDAQ markets on next Friday or the closing bell ringing ceremony as those stocks make that transaction, as investors um, uh, make that investment into the, uh, the changes uh, that are, are going to happen within the Russell suite of uh, indexes. So I will be at the closing bell in Times Square. Oh, look at you having just all sorts of fun going on hither and yon over there. I, I, I usually say I don't envy the travel schedule for uh, Mr. Sean. These last couple of weeks, maybe, maybe, maybe not so much. But speaking of changes to the to the <laughs> Russell here, some interesting changes afoot over there. I was looking at some of the numbers coming into showtime here. And we always, I mean, how long has Apple dominated the equity conversation, right? It's been oh, the number since 2012. Yeah, since it's been the number one driver for brokers forever. It always tops our options volume charts. It tops the equity volume charts. Pretty much any given day that ends with Y, chances are Apple's going to be at the top of it in terms of volume. But this year, in terms of Russell, not so much. In fact, the first year since, I think you just said it, since 2012, uh, Sean, that Apple will not be the largest stock in the U.S. indexes in terms of market cap listeners. Actually, nope, it got trumped, usurped by another tech name, Microsoft. Microsoft rallying nearly 30% in the in the measurement period here uh, to, with a total market cap of $974.2 billion. Remember, they rank them as of May 10th, so that's of, as of May 10th, to actually knock Apple off their pedestal. Microsoft, the number one market cap stock in the Russell 2000. Big changes afoot for you guys over there, Sean. Yeah, Apple. Uh, Apple's actually number three, right? Uh, Amazon is uh, is is in there at number two, as of that date. So um, yeah, uh, um, Apple's number three on that on that list, followed by Alphabet or Google, and uh, face, uh, Facebook's uh, close behind there as well. Yeah, that. How often can we say that Apple's number three in anything, and yet uh, there they are, bumped down to a lowly number three over there for the folks in in Cupertino. And speaking about Russell and all the love and all the craziness going on, uh, the folks over there at uh, at Open Markets, the blog there, uh, writing about some interesting stuff about how maybe if you're intrigued and you've been seeing the numbers going up for these micro futures that have been literally lighting up the tape. Of late, I do believe the tape is on fire as we speak. Uh, that may be an interesting time to maybe turn some of that love over there to the Russell 2000. They point out a lot of different factors that could potentially be driving that. Of course, we had the Fed this week. Uh, they've uh, they've changed their interest rate stance from at least not raising rates. They're holding steady, holding pat for now, and then in the future, probably going to be lowering them. Uh, so looking at that. In those types of lowering environments, we typically see small caps having a better time getting access to debt and acquiring capital with lower rates. So that's usually a big factor, a much larger factor for small caps than it is for large caps. So that could be one thing that can maybe lead 
to a bit of an outperformance uh, for Russell 2000. International trade, obviously also been in the spotlight a lot lately. And uh, so, of course, uh, U.S. Ca- U.S. small caps don't get a large portion of their revenue from international trade. So they're, I wouldn't say immune because we've all seen that lately they have not been immune, but a little bit more insulated than some others to those big headwinds uh, of international trade. At the same time, though, uh, while in, in a strong economy, also a strong bellwether, and we're seeing some good data that uh, – that uh, that the small business optimism index and other things at their highest level they have been in some time. So all of that may be leading in to a little bit of a maybe maybe a little bit of more bloom on the rose here uh, for small caps. And of course, all the volatility we've seen of late uh, from the trade wars has impacted the Nasdaq, the S and P, and the Dow a lot more than it has the Russell. So all these things maybe could be could be arming you for the fact that a little bit of action in Russell 2000. It's kind of pointing to Sean. We've seen a lot of a lot of action in uh, these micro futures of late lighting up the board there's nasdaq there's s&p a lot of them and kind of bringing up the rear was russell and i think this article points out some interesting reasons why maybe maybe uh russell 2000 may be an interesting place to analyze are you hearing that from people as well as you've been looking at these numbers sean that people are maybe starting to take another look here at, at some of the russell products i am um uh, uh, and and you know, you you you're, you you took a lot of the wind out of uh, some of the comments that I was just going to make, but absolutely, all of those all of those points are in, in, incredibly relevant. The, the the word insulated from from tariff type of stuff is uh, is perfectly relevant. But these uh, I gotta say these micro minis that that you just brought up are are uh, just a, a, a really good um, a, a, just a really good success story for the CME. Uh, you know, average daily volumes in the in the double thousand, like twenty twenty five ish thousand a day. There's uh, there's open interest. Uh, the product's trading globally, um, and and you've got every segment of the market trading them as well. You know, it's not just a retail product. You've got uh, you've got your banks trading it. You've got hedge funds. You've got proprietary trading firms trading the product, um, and and it's again it's global. The Europe's trading the product, Latin America's trading the product, the Asian Pacific uh, region's trading the product, uh, and you know it just the fact that these these are uh, minis make it yeah a smaller product for for let's say a retail segment, but institutionally this is an opportunity for those options traders to really surgically hedge that delta, and I think they're taking an advantage of that with these products because. Uh, they are fungible with the bigs, but this is a way to really surgically enhance that 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 hedging of a delta. So, uh, just just some of the stuff I'd I'd like to bring up about the Russell 2000 minis, but or I'm sorry, micros. Again, all eyes uh, are are kind of shifting to this Russell 2000 because of all the things you just said. Yeah. Um, insulation, insulation from tariffs, tax benefits that uh, were put in place. And again, they're pure, they're really are they really are truly a domestic play, um, and uh, with all of those those uh, things to create momentum, they are the ingredients for outperformance in in terms of an index performance. So, uh, um, I am uh, very bullish on the volume and open interest, and more eyes, more traders, more clients being focused on the Russell 2000 going forward for the remainder of 2019. And again, with this recon happening with, with all of, all of this type of discussions and focus, I think we're going to see a a big number next Friday. Yeah. You know, this, this is uh, certainly an interesting time uh, for all of these products. And if you wanted a little, a lower cost flyer on Russell 2000, you've literally had never had a cheaper way to do it with these micros. Uh, So uh, certainly something uh, to keep in mind there speaking of what's going on you mentioned the options and hedging their deltas and of course you're right it can't all be retail paper the amount of size that's going up in these contracts i think cme has said now this is the most successful new product they've ever launched uh, so that can't all be retail it's got to be institutions flocking in there as well driving some of that volume because the numbers are just uh, are just ridiculous i think is a technical term in terms of how much paper they're putting up so clearly institutions and retail liking themselves a little bit of a bite-sized chunk of some equity indices. Hopefully we'll see some options on them sometime soon. I think we're going to see them sooner rather than later now that they are they are quite literally lighting up the charts here uh, these days for the volume. Speaking of what's going on out there in Russell land and looking at the volatility out there, it has been an interesting week. It has been an interesting volatility period. Sean, I think since the last time you've been on, which has been about a month, 
Uh, we've seen kind of an interesting ebbing and flowing and then ebbing again and then flowing again in the equity vol space. We can't really lately we found a bit of a of a bit of a floor, it seems like. But before that, it was, you know, we saw exacerbation of trade war with Mexico. Vol shoots up. Then we kind of come off a bit. Then we exacerbate trade war with China. It shoots up again and it comes off again. It's been this kind of this interesting little cycle, kind of range bound coming into showtime. We're seeing volatility kind of finding that floor a little bit again. We kind of mentioned it was hovering. The VIX was kind of glued to 16 for a while. It came through that now and actually is back blew through that again down to the 14 handle. Now back up around 15 coming into showtime again. So one of those weird days where most of the major indices are up and yet vol also up, showing some interesting things are afoot out there in the equity space. Uh, we're seeing our, so VIX right now about a 15 coming into showtime with about a handle lower than where it was this time last week. Uh, RVX a little bit shy of 18, about 17.8 that puts it down about a handle and a half almost from last show. So vol coming in maybe a little bit more aggressively out there in the small caps right now than it has been in some of the others. Either way, that VIX RVX spread has tightened quite a bit. It's down below three now, about 2.8 handles, uh, down about almost half a handle from where it was this time uh, last week out here. So a lot of interesting stuff afoot. Let me look here really quickly, Sean, before we keep on rolling. Again, you guys can... You guys can play the home game, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO. That will bring you directly into the TWIFO report so you can see this for yourself. If you're logging into Quick Strike, if you're a Quick Strike user, you want to see the TWIFO reports yourself, just go to that Quick Reports tab on the top there and then follow along. Right now we're looking at the E-mini Russell 2000 options. That's obviously in the equities section, and you'll see if you do that. We're coming into showtime here. We're seeing a strong week for the equities, as you might imagine. Through today's show here right now, we're up about 2.5% right now in uh, in the Russell 2000 at about a 1563 so it's been a good little run up nearly 40 handles and we're seeing interestingly enough looks like in the money puts leading the dance out here with expiring in less than a day 1580 puts are kind of leading the dance out here in the e-mini Russell 2000 let's skip on over here to the e-mini S&P 500 to see if that similar paper flow here going on out there, which is near term out of the money puts. S&P, again, up about a little over 2%, not quite 2.5%, about 2%, up about 58 handles at about almost 29 half, about 29.49. And no surprise, we're seeing the 29 half calls also going out in less than a day, leading the dance here with quite a few going up out there in the E-mini S&P 500. We've been talking a lot of equities, Sean. We got to roll on some other products, but before we do, any other thoughts in terms of recon and uh, equities before we roll on into some other fun product categories, sir? Yeah, uh, in terms of volatility, everybody asks the question every year, doesn't the recon uh, heighten volatility in the U.S. markets because so much stock trades? Um, and the answer is actually no, um, the, it, it doesn't because the, the, the mechanism to trade the stock on the close has really kind of uh, reduce that that uh, transaction from creating a volatile transaction. The Nasdaq's closing cross is one of those key mechanisms that has been created um, to to ease that transaction to make it a simple, seamless uh, uh, trade for for investors. So um, I, I get that question every year. What does recon do to to volatility in the markets? And then we kind of ask the question, well, what happens to recon in high volatility? times. And again, uh, the analysis has shown that uh, this these crosses on the close and this closing cro cross mechanism that NASDAQ has created has enabled recon to happen without that that uh, uh, big, big move on the close. So um, just to, in case uh, you get that question across the uh, one of your screens today, I just wanted to kind of put that back out there again. Well, it kind of so makes we're excited sense. About it. Kind of makes but, sense, right? It's so fast. There's no time for volatility, right? It's what is it, a millisecond? Most of this exactly. stuff's going up in. Exactly, it's like milliseconds, right? So it's just a, a, a just a, a blip in time, and 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 this, these transactions are done. Um, but it is it is an exciting day. It's an exciting volume day uh, for our for our exchanges, NYSE and for Nasdaq. So we're uh, we're we're looking forward to a big day on uh, Friday next week, the twenty eighth. That just shows how much the markets have evolved, right? They can put up, you know, billions of shares in fractions of a second without even really registering a blip. Isn't that it's kind of fascinating when you think about it that way? Really, really cool. Yeah. 
So there you go. No, no vol from billions of shares changing hands, listeners. It's fascinating stuff. You guys check it out for yourself. Of course, uh, semigroup.com slash Twifo is the place to go for the options data. Or just go to footsierussell.com, of course, and uh, check out. They've been tweet And actually, give them a follow on Twitter if you haven't, at FTSE FTSERussell. They've been putting out a lot of great data around recon about like things like Microsoft and Apple and who's leading the dance. So if you like that kind of stuff, and I'm guessing you probably do, uh, FTSE Russell, a place to go. All right, Sean, rest your rest your voice for a minute. We got some questions for you in a little bit coming from the listeners. We'll get to those in a second. First, I gotta I gotta dive into a few other product categories. We can't escape crude, Sean. Sean's been Sean's been crude's been dominating the tape. Not so much Sean. Not your fault. You haven't been tweeting about it. It's been Trump. Trump tweeting. And I haven't been crude either. <laughs> yes, you haven't been crude and you haven't been tweeting. So I should not blame you for the, the <laughs> massive moves we're seeing. And nonetheless, we're gonna blame Sean anyway. Sean is the one single handedly driving. Uh, the crude markets. Now, of course, we've we've seen a prolonged sell-off of late in crude, and this week, a little bit of reversal of that trend. A lot of that coming today. We saw, of course, uh, our our administration tweeting out that Iran made a very big mistake after they shot down one of our drones. This is, of course, Iran. Uh, these drone attack following some attacks on Exxon Mobil and Shell and other operations near uh, southern cities in Iraq. No, no claims responsibility, but people can put two and two together and probably conclude who was behind that. These, of course, come on the heels of the attacks on tankers last week. So a lot of this, obviously, Iran making itself known that they want to disrupt some of the flow of oil coming out of the Middle East. Whenever there's intense conflict and when explosives are quite literally going off, that tends to bump things up. And we're seeing a little bit of an upswing up there of late. Remember, you guys go to semigroup.com slash twifo or bantix.com or quickstrack, wherever you're going to get into the quickstrack, get into the energy, choose WTI, and you can see exactly what we're going to. Coming into today's show, we're seeing a nice little run. Remember, we were in the mid to low 50s as of the end of last week, and the 50 handle WTI coming into today's show, not so much. We're seeing a run of about not quite five handles, about four and a half handles net on the week. A lot of that coming today, up about eight and a half percent. Uh, so kind of rally ho a foot here, not quite breaking the 60 handle, but still getting a lot closer to it. We're seeing some conflicting opinions on whether this really has some legs or not. People who are long term watchers of the crude space coming out saying, well, you know, Iran doesn't really have the muscle to do a lot there and and, you know, other things like that. And we haven't really sent a huge presence there. We've sent some more troops, but not uh, not exactly uh, big things. We've also seen, obviously, the Fed. Uh, Fed talking about holding Pat, but maybe indicating they could cut rates in the future. That could that gave a little bit of boost uh, to crude as well. Also seeing gas demand obviously coming in summer driving season. A record high last week in the U.S. So all this kind of helping to give a little bit of a lift to that bullish scenario out there for crude. That wasn't enough. OPEC scheduling its next meeting for July 1st to 2nd. So watch for that in the coming weeks as well. That'll be a key driver for crude supply going forward. But coming in this week at, at about a 57 and a quarter. Out there, so our 57 handle is pretty much the at the money. Let's see what's lighting it up. Vol actually in and in quite a bit, which is interesting, kind of across the board. We've been talking for a while how crude vol is kind of an unheralded volatility product. We had Russell from Tab Group on a few weeks ago talking about the nature of crude volatility and how maybe it's a little more poised to outperform than people give it credit for. Everyone talks equity volatility, but the the commodity volatility is interesting, particularly in energy. There were some crude oil volatility products. They still are listed. OIV and OVX are two interesting ones. I like OIV more because it replicates WTI or tracks WTI as opposed to USO. But to each their own. Either way, if you're trading these products, you should really be monitoring those as barometers for broad market volatility here. And looking in, it's coming off quite a bit. If you go out to some of the later months like AUG and SEP and beyond, we're actually seeing off several handles in the volatility. So the vol comes in quickly and it retreats quickly in crude. And we're kind of seeing that playing out here. I guess the numbers being reported in addition to some of the escalating tensions that actually could be seen as a bit of an event risk coming off maybe. Uh, because clearly the market is squeezing out some of the vol here, except for the front contract, which has less than the day to go. So that's kind of all gamma, not really a lot of vol to be had there. Let's see what's lighting it up in terms of activity this week. And it seems like number one with the bullet listeners is by pretty much a, a country mile here are the AUG 45 puts doing uh, near, not quite 20,000 contracts, but pretty close to it. Uh, so that was our big, big action strike of the week, trading a ton on Monday, nearly 8,000. So almost half of the volume coming on Monday, 4,500 on Tuesday, about 2,700 on Wednesday and about 3,000 today. And a lot of that opening. So a lot of opening 
downside put positioning coming into this week as the tensions were escalating. Kind of interesting. Could be opening to hedge. Obviously, that usually is the case here, but also could be some premium harvesting there as well. Typically in the commodities, it's not as much. I mean, equities, it's it's all premium harvesting all the time, it seems like sometimes. But and the commodity is a little bit more of a mixed bag. I'm probably going to go out on a limb and say they're probably opening uh, to do some hedging on that level. But again, we never know until we really dig in for certain. But that is the number one uh, with a bullet. In fact, a 55% of the volume uh, coming in that AUG, AUG expiration month here this week. That's how much action was out there. Number two were the 65 calls. So pretty out of the money calls. Doing about 14,500 contracts. The lion's share, kind of a tie between Monday and today, both doing about 42 to 4,400 uh, contracts. Net slightly opening, so 65 calls were kind of back and forth action all throughout the week. I guess people prepping for or bidding on or hedging against maybe a, a spike up back to those mid-60 levels. Then we got number three to 50 puts, a little more relevant puts, about 13,000 of those. The lion's share going up today, 5,000 and change, which is interesting. Spike and a little bit of a spike in downside put action. So maybe some of that's closing, taking some volume off the table. Maybe some of that overriding to draw a line in that 50 sand. Uh, either way, interesting stuff and rounding out here. Let's see. That, that's actually number four here. The 60 calls, 12,000 and change. And round out the top five here, the 47 puts. So we had 45, 47, 50 puts. Kind of a nice little put strip here. 10,000, almost 11,000 of those. The lion's share also today, 4,000. So maybe some verticals going up 45 47 because a lot of put downside put paper far out of the money put paper really uh, going up here in aug today given today's upside action that's kind of interesting let's look here really quick let's go out to aug again because that's where a lot of the action was let's see what's going on skew wise as a result of this kind of crazy topsy turvy week last week the puts were leading the dance they were 5.6 percent rich to the at the money so the bid was to the downside this week they're more bid 7.2 percent not not surprising given the fact that what we saw in that kind of Gives a little ammunition to what I was just saying earlier. Those are probably put buyers. If the skew is going up, that's probably the case there. Uh, and then we're also seeing last week the calls were about 2.2% offered to the at the money. Now coming in quite a bit, coming in about four handles, 6.2% cheap to the at the money. So puts getting bid, calls getting off. That's kind of what you expect as you rally a little bit. It's a sharp rally. Somebody might get a, a little bit of a bop. If it's an unexpected rally, that's clearly not the case. Kind of looks like we're sliding up the skew curve rather than shifting it, as Nick would say. So uh, that's kind of what you expect. You're going up, you're going into a little bit lower implied volatility range. The calls come in, the puts get bid. That seems like that's pretty standard fare here for all things crude oil. Oh, before we roll out of crude, uh, Sean was talking before about Blue and Eric Norlin and the whole research team over there at CME. Eric Norlin, he'll be on the show. In a few weeks, he has an interesting research paper. These guys are they're just cranking away over there. Great research. If you want to just if you want to fill some time, you want to look at some interesting nuggets of data uh, on the commodity space or in equities as well, just go to the CME website, cmegroup.com. They usually put Blue and Eric stuff right on the homepage. So you can't miss it. They have research and data and, and reports on gold and on crude and on equity volatility. You name it, ags. They're just cranking away at content over there. Here's the most recent paper coming out of Eric. Three signs that oil may be at a bottom. You should check it out for yourself. I'll just kind of read some of the key takeaways for you. First off, he mentions soybean oil price, which is interesting and also quite frequently a leading indicator for crude. They, they've been falling for months, so they had been falling. Maybe a little bit of a turnaround out there now. Number two, in terms of signs that crude may be at a bottom, out-of-the-money crude options skewness becoming less negative than usual. We just talked about uh, what's going on in the skew out here in WTI. So, again, skew. Always a fascinating indicator, one to keep in mind out there. And number three, out of the money options on refined products like the gas and others have extreme, excuse me, achieved extreme positive skewness. So that perhaps also showing that there's a little bit of some pent up demand for uh, some return for crude upside. Again, great visuals, great analysis, much longer than just those three points I gave you there. Check it out. Three signs that oil may be at the bottom, probably around the CME homepage there as we keep on rolling. Let's go on into really quickly into some metals as well here let's pull up the again you guys want to follow along play the home game move on over to metals talk a little bit of gold obviously it's a fed week we'll talk a little bit of what the impact is on gold out there because the fed watch tool was showing about a little more than 75 percent chance that the fed would keep things pretty much the same and that's pretty much what they did uh 75 chance leading that so that's why the fed watch tool Pretty interesting stuff. If you're if you're watching the Fed and you're not watching that tool, 
you're kind of doing it wrong. So uh, check that out over there. See me homepage as well as we look on here for the precious shiny stuff. Gold, again, all this news with the international turmoil, with the rates and everything else. Getting a nice lift again this week. Up nearly 50 handles, or about 3.6%. Not quite at the 1,400 handle, but pretty darn close. 1,393. Now, mix all the hand wringing about a wool it break. 1,300 seemed like a distant memory. Up about 100 handles uh, from those levels where we were shy of 1,300. Not too long ago. So it's been an interesting week. Yeah, rallying about 50 handles this week alone. So it's been a good week for all you gold bugs out there. I know you're out there. Because you write to us and you you give us your thoughts on gold, usually bullish. <laughs> so, yeah, you guys are happy campers, it sounds like, this week. Vol, interestingly enough, also up and up pretty strong. That's something we have not been able to say about gold for quite a while out there. That, you know, we've saying how long have we been saying? In fact, listeners have written in saying you don't need to talk about gold vol anymore because it's pretty much dead. This week, not so much. Up multiple handles kind of across the board. Uh, which has kind of been fun, good to say, and kind of fun. In fact, you, we mentioned the the volatility index for WTI, which is OIV. There also is GVZ, which is effectively a VIX for gold. Not many people know about it because it hasn't really done much of late. But if you look at that one as well, looking at that methodology, that, of course, tracks the GLD, but you're seeing a similar level on that. It was at a 12.5 as of just yesterday, and coming into today, it spiked up to almost 16, 1573. So these are... These are some impressive vol numbers and some impressive vol movements for gold. I, I mean, it's it's anyone's guess whether these are sustainable. I'm probably going to go out on a limb and say probably not because gold has a history of not sustaining these vol spikes that maybe come in. But who knows? We could be in a new regime here where gold vol is getting a little bit of life. How many times has Nick said it pays the rent to be long some gold vol? And certainly this week, that has been the case. If you long it, you probably want to scalp it aggressively. Maybe you want to close it out before the before the worm turns. But uh, either way, all you gold vol bulls have been writing in saying, "What's the deal with gold vol? What's the deal with gold vol? Is it is it is there any chance for it turning around in the near term? This week, at least, it turned and it turned pretty aggressively. Let's go out here to see where the the biggest action of the week, listeners, was out here also in August. Pretty close though. It, these uh, five-day remaining contracts also had some pretty decent volume, but the number one with the bullet were the 1,400s, the par calls here in August, doing 11,200 uh, contracts on that bad boy. The lion's share actually coming today. 5,000 of that 11,000 coming today. 3,800 yesterday. The rest scattered throughout the week. A good chunk of that opening. So opening upside, not exactly surprising on a week when gold's up 50 handles. Opening, not even that much upside anymore. It's 1400 It's almost at the money. So pretty close. Followed hot on its heels, actually, by a little bit closer to home here. These are now in the monies. 1360, 1360 calls. These are in July. So these are these are about to go, listeners. These have, uh, let's see, these have about, not quite a week, about five days left to go. 11,085 of those, so almost Hot on its heels uh, for our number one contract. Only a couple hundred, only a couple hundred separating the number one and number two spots here in gold. With about fifty four hundred coming on Wednesday, listeners, and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Again, slightly biased towards opening, so a lot of back and forth on that strike now, which is now in the money. Uh, so we saw about twenty three hundred on Monday, twenty seven hundred on Tuesday, fifty four hundred Wednesday. Maybe they came in and closed them out. Some closing on Wednesday. Maybe they traded early in the week and then closed them out. Either way, a lot of a lot of back and forth action on these thirteen sixties. Now in the money calls here in gold. Let's and actually let's go back out to where we saw our big print here in the AUG contract. Let's take a look at the skew. Because again, gold skew is always a fascinating one to watch. It tends to move and move pretty aggressively. Let's see what happened here in August this week. This downside puts in gold were about 9.3% cheap to get the money. So the bid was to the upside, the bid was to the calls. This week, they're about the same. They moved about a half a percent, 9.8%. It's not quite 10%. Uh, so they're still even a little cheaper than they were this time last week. Meanwhile, calls getting all the love, as you would expect, with this kind of aggressive move to the upside. They were 13.6% rich. To the at the money this week, they're north of 16, 16.2%. So the calls continuing with a bid. Again, if you're if you're kind of exploding up and not just sliding up, <laughs> then you're gonna get a bit of a bit of a boost to the upside. And on top of that, the skew was a bid to the upside. So we're seeing pretty much it play out like you would expect here with a bit of a, a bit of an aggressive upside move here in goals. So look out really quickly. Like to see if there's any far off prints that are a little wa little wonky here, a little wacky. 
not too much in the crazy town level. See about 1,200 of the 2,500 calls going up in Dece of 2020. That's kind of really about it. So not as much in the crazy long-term camp for gold this week. Before we roll off of medals really quickly, more great research coming out of Eric over there from the research team at CME. Uh, we've talked before about copper and what a weird – you guys have written in asking us what's going on with copper. Kind of, a, It's a weird spot right now because copper, kind of the lion's share of the story – for copper is Chinese demand. And that, of course, has not exactly been robust uh, of late. And yet we're seeing kind of a weird paradox. In fact, Eric calls his paper the, Ch the copper paradox because of we're seeing this escalation of trade war between U.S. and China and also the intense fight going on in the U.S. about monetary policy. And yet neither of those have really been big drivers of late for, for copper options, which is strange. In fact, implied vol also kind of reflecting that. Implied vol and, and copper has rarely been lower. And so it kind of puts us in this weird kind of paradoxical scenario for copper. And uh, some interesting takeaways here. You guys can check out this paper again for yourself. Uh, copper options, implied vol, trading pretty much at record low. So we always do a lot of hand-wringing about gold vol, but copper vol pretty much in the toilet as well. Uh, price of copper, obviously, driven by China. Chinese story, very much in flux. And, uh, and of course, the option prices uh, for copper, they're, while as much as underlying price is driven by Chinese demand, the options very much tied to U.S. monetary policy, some tight U.S. monetary policy that could translate into a little bit of a boost for copper vol going forward, something to keep an eye on here. And, of course, the Fed starts easing and easing aggressively, that could obviously keep a lid on copper options going forward. So interesting stuff. Again, check out the full report for yourself. Uh, the options, I should say, the copper paradox by Eric for some great charts and graphs and all that other fun stuff. Speaking of charts and graphs, we like to check in every week, listeners. And if you're doing it for yourself in Quick Strike, just head on into the Quick Reports tab. And if you do that, you'll see a variety of different choices, including the market scans option. And if you do that, click on that, set the timer or the, the date range, if you want to call it there, to one week. And if you do that, listeners, you'll be able to see what we look here next. I like to call this just quite simply the movers and shakers out here. What is lighting up the tape here in terms of movement to the upside and the downside this week in terms of the broad spectrum of products that actually trade over there on CME? Let's start on the dark side this time. Let's start from the bottom. The biggest downside mover this week. Again, this is pure underlying. This is not options or open interest or implied volatility. It's just the futures movement. We're seeing oats off 7%, 7.14%. Number two, nat gas off 6.25%. Number three, lean hogs off 2.6%. So a big jump between nat gas and lean hogs. Almost, no, no not quite 4%, but pretty close. Uh, number four, again, from, from the bottom here, KC wheat off 2.18%. And the bottom one in terms of uh, movement to the dark side, wheat off 1.25%. Let's go the opposite. Let's go the other way from the top here. Let's start from number five. The number five largest mover of the week here, Euro dollars up 4.4%. Number four, heating oil up 4.5%. Number three, iron ore up nearly 5%, 4.91%. Number two, Brent 5.76%. And taking the top spot, our old friend WTI with about eight, almost 9%, 8.81% net here on the week here in terms of movement. So big movers and shakers up here this week. Uh, again, energy leading the dance at least to the upside. Speaking of leading the dance, I wonder who's going to lead the dance from you guys with your questions because it's time to get into your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider stocktwits.com slash options insider or via questions at the options you can also submit your feedback via our options insider radio network mobile app available for ios android and kindle fire devices you can even ask your questions live every friday at 3 p.m central via our mixler chat room so grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R.com. 
All right, everybody. Welcome to the Futures Options Feedback. This is indeed the portion of the show where you guys take the reins, questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom, all that good stuff. We do indeed like to hear from you guys. Speaking of which, we like to ask you guys questions here as well. And we asked you guys a question of the week this week, which is kind of fun. We thought we'd ask you to just let you guys, let you guys, let your brains run a little bit. Let do a little bit of a thought experiment, a little bit of a fun pop quiz. Not as scary as a pop quiz in school, but a fun one. Uh, we thought we'd ask you here, you know, lots going on in the vol space this week. So we thought we'd just tell us, use your gut. No cheating. Don't use your analytics platforms. And Sean, I'll give you a chance to play along with this one as well here. We gave you four choices. We said, hey, which of the following names do you think has the highest 30-day realize? So actual vol, not implied or anything else like that. Again, no cheating. Just use your gut. We gave you four choices. Tesla, a big market mover. A Bitcoin, been moving a lot lately, up to 9,000, back off again. A WTI, which has also been moving a lot lately, and we've seen the vol jump quite a bit. Or the NASDAQ, a.k.a. the Qs. Uh, Sean, I, I don't, I'll give you a chance right now. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I, I have to do some digging, which is I don't want to give my answer because I don't want to skew the results, but I'll allow you to vote. Do you, have a, do you have a thought? Which one do you think is your gut telling you has been the most volatile over the last month? Gut says... NASDAQ. Interesting. You know, that's a good that's a good choice because it has been moving. Of course, there's also the broad index component to it, too. And maybe that can mute it or not. Uh, of course, Tesla, a part of that as well. So that contributes to NASDAQ. Ball. Ironically enough, Sean, exactly. ironically enough, the, the NASDAQ not getting any love in our poll. It's got about a day left here for our question of the week, listeners. Only 4% choosing the NASDAQ, Sean. So no love there. Uh, number 4% for the NASDAQ, a.k.a. the Qs. Uh, number 3 coming in is kind of the rest are kind of close. 28% for WTI. Number two is Bitcoin with 32%. And number one leading the charge is Tesla, Sean, which also has been moving. It was down sub 200 a few weeks ago. Now it's over 200. So that's been moving with 36%. Again, I purposely haven't looked at the answer myself yet because I don't want to color my perception. But I do know coming into this week, Bitcoin was at about a 93 or 95 realized vol. So that's pretty high. But is that higher that's than... High. Is that higher than WTI? Is that higher than Tesla? Is it higher than NASDAQ? I don't know. Make your voices heard, listeners. We'll, we will crunch the numbers and give you the actual answer this time next week. At options is the place to go. Or just, just email Sean over there at FTSE Russell. He'll, he'll email your answer to him directly, and he'll forward it. And don't make fun of me for choosing NASDAQ, you guys. Don't. He's playing. He's, just, he's the I'm index gonna, guy. He's got to choose index. It's I'm required by law. I'm, an, I'm, I'm biased. So, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm always looking for that index that index look, that index, and you know, NASDAQ is, is what it is, but, uh, you know, again, focus on Russell 2000. I mean, that's why I'm here. Right. So, uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, good stuff. speaking of Russell 2000, we got a question here. It's kind of along the lines, of what you kind of broke down for us. Maybe, maybe you have some more data you can share with us, Sean. This question comes from Lewis. Lewis wants to know how many shares changed hands as a direct result of the recon last year. And also, he has a kind of a corollary question. He wants to know, why is this such an enormous event? Well, you, you kind of you laid it out for us a little bit at the top of the show. Maybe if you want to recall those numbers here for Lewis, uh, Sean, maybe if you have any other color you want to add about why this is such a freaking huge event, I think it's a technical term, uh, break it down. Lewis here wants more data, sir. Sure. Um, in terms of notional value, last June – $58.7 billion notional value traded on the New York Stock Exchange. $39.2 billion no notional value traded, uh, billions of dollars of notional value traded. On NASDAQ, 1.88 billion shares traded on the bell uh, last year using that closing cross mechanism we discussed earlier. Um, recon, why is this such a big day? It's, it's an annual event where Russell, FTSE Russell, reconstitutes uh, their, their index suite, and it's to keep those indexes relevant. You know, a lot of things change within companies during the year. There's mergers and acquisitions. There's, there's companies that uh, declare bankruptcy. There's companies that uh, have other corporate uh, events that uh, make that, that uh, equation that puts you into the Russell 1000 or 2000 indexes, uh, moves you from one to the other or moves you from one back to the other. Um, 
that equation happens once a year. And for, uh, for purposes that are, uh, have been designed in this reconstitution practice uh, or exercise that we do once a year, we have found through discussing this with our clients and from uh, a client input uh, situation and a cost effective uh, scenario, the best thing to do is to have this reconstitution once a year here in the United States. And uh, it works, customers are happy, the markets have, uh, have grown accustomed to this transaction happening every June. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not a volatile transaction as we've talked about earlier and it works and it's an exciting day um, and it's become quite an annual event. Uh, I hope that answers uh, Lewis's is his name Lewis Lewis's question. Yes, Lewis. I, I guess it makes sense. You know, you don't if you do it like every quarter, that would be a different bit of a different beast, right? Wouldn't have the same impact. Maybe too much, maybe too annoying for your clients, right? You got a lot of ch- churn. If you have it all done at once, then you know you, you concentrate it all, makes it a bigger event as a result, and you know maybe maybe a little bit more they can manage it a little bit better than if it was spread out maybe uh, throughout the year where they're constantly dealing with rebalancing on a regular basis. Uh, so yeah, there was a time where there was a time where recon happened uh, quarterly and then semi annually, but you know uh, after doing so much research, uh, annual con- reconstitution has really been the best way to ac- accurately represent the broad market and market cap segment. So um, you know from a from from a, a accurate representation and cost, this is the best way to uh, to capture that for our our indexes and uh, it works. So. Uh, we're, we're, we're excited to have that, that annual event next week on Friday. There you go, Lewis. You ask and you shall receive straight from the horse's mouth there. He, he wants his data. Hopefully he, he, he got a lot of data there. Hopefully hopefully that's enough for you, Lewis. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's keep rolling here. Bernando. Oh, what a name. Bernando. Ber, Bernando Raffo. Bernando Raffo. That's, that's a mouthful. He wants to know, can you do a skew breakdown for Euro dollars? Okay, these are your old your old stomping grounds here, Sean. You used to be a Euro dollars guy. I never had the pleasure of trading. What is it? The whites and the pinks and the greens and the blues and all that fun stuff. I never I never got out there. I, I was busy on the indices over there uh, on the SIBO. But it is an active week for the rates. Obviously, Euro dollars uh, having a lot of action this week. Coming in net movement, uh, not a huge amount here for the Euro dollars in terms of I think about a, a tenth of a point, not even. Uh, but size, volume. I mean, we talk the numbers here. It, it really is kind of kind of hard to to fathom versus something. We were just talking gold. You know, you're talking you know eleven, twelve thousand contracts. WTI a little bit more. You know, twenty, thirty, maybe forty thousand. Some of the big prints out there. Now you're talking euro dollars, and it's yet another order of magnitude uh, beyond it. Like the most active month out here. This or, most active contract this week, listeners, or month was July or something. Dece. With about twenty and a half percent of the paper, they and then one in one contract, ninety seven ninety seven point seven five puts to almost three hundred thousand contracts, two hundred eighty two thousand. So this is just a different beast entirely. Particularly this week with the Fed action, that's of course when Euro dollars are lighting it up. So pick a month, pick a strike, and it does more than almost most other products we talk about here, just in terms of net volume. It's just that kind of a beast. So. Coming to grips with the skews is a bit of a different beast depending on where you're looking. I'm just going to pull it out here. We'll look at we'll look at Dees because this was the biggest volume month this week, and we'll break down the skew out here for you. Again, you guys can do this yourselves. See me group.com slash twifo to select Euro dollars or go to quickstrike.net, log in there, or sign up for Quick Strike, and then you can pull up Euro dollars. You can do all this analysis yourself. Click on the quick reports. Click on the Twifo report if you want it to do it for you here. And look at the quick skew column, the 25-day quick skew column. It'll tell you pretty much how it's broken up from versus last week. The top number is last week. The bottom number is this week. And you'll see that out here in this month here, we'll see the puts were cheap last week. They're about 5% cheap to the at the money this week. They're even cheaper. 8.4% cheap to the at the money. So puts coming in from a vol perspective and the calls. Getting some love. They're about five, almost five and a half percent rich to the at the money this week, about seven and a half percent rich to the at the money. So a little bit of a bid for the calls. Not, not, not exactly surprising, giving some upside action. Sean, would you say you're an old school Euro dollars guy? Would you say that's a typical skew shape for Euro dollars where the calls are usually bid, the puts are offered, or is that somewhat abnormal given the recent events we've been seeing? You know, it's it's been too long for me to be able to opine. So I'd I'd rather 
just leave it to the uh, the market and the implied balance that you can see on your screen because uh, I actually have not taken a look in such a long period of time. I would probably do your client a disservice by opining on that, but it's okay, sure. I, 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 I like to lead you to the dark side. So that's my job to make you to make you go. Well, I'm go, in the hot seat. Go. Okay. You're in the hot seat. The hot so seat. when you're in the hot seat, you got to squirm a little bit. Otherwise, what fun uh, would it be? But yeah, you know, we we don't we. We talk rates on this show when when these things are happening, like with the Fed, like when obviously it's hitting up now. A lot of times, the the complex it doesn't have that much. That's really you know we could parse where there's so much going on. It's kind of like a fire hose. But weeks like this, kind of interesting to watch. I think the skew is particularly interesting to watch, and the calls getting bid out there and getting bid some more. So maybe interesting stuff out there for those of you out there. Again, I know a lot of the audience in this show is retail. I don't know how much retail. Obviously, there is because there's so much volume. There has to be retail, and I don't know how much retail is really playing in the euro dollars. But still, you're writing in, you're asking about it. So ask and you shall receive. If you want more rates on the show, let us know. We can always make that happen. You guys ask and we dance like monkeys for your entertainment and or education. Let's wrap it up with this one, Sean. It's kind of an interesting question. Comes from Cheeves. Cheeves. I like that. Cheeves wants to know, how do I easily tell which future is the underlying for my options contract? It seems needlessly confusing. You know what, Cheeves? I I agree with you. I'm with you on this. This is uh this is more of a problem, quite frankly, than it should be. We've heard people on this show and other shows writing in whether you're trading, let's say, it could be you know options on corn or options on the S and P or the Russell or even something like a volatility options on volatility futures. It it kind of comes down to the way your broker displays it for you, and it should be easy. It should be obvious. Any good broker should make it obvious. A lot of the brokers will, for example, if you're looking at an options chain on a future, they will have that relevant future displayed prominently somewhere next to those options chains. Option maybe above it, maybe to the side somewhere. But it should be relatively obvious. You'll click on, let's say, a SEP contract, exactly which option which future that contract is going to be traded off of. So you're not you don't think, oh, I'm gonna do my analysis and, and maybe you're off by a, a one contract here or there and all of a sudden all of your analysis is out the window. So many people have written into us with this question. It still is more of a problem, quite frankly, than it should be. Uh, I think a, a, a lot of this is starting to be fixed with a lot of the big options brokerage firms getting more into futures options now because they're bringing a lot of those that expensive R&D that they've done on the equity options front and applying that to futures options, trying to make the process a little bit more seamless, a little bit less painful, making a little bit more obvious what you're trading. And it's not done by a long part, but they spend hundreds of millions of dollars making compelling front ends and UIs for you guys to use. And now they're applying that to futures options. Whereas in the past, a lot of the legacy, shall we say, futures and futures options only brokers, they haven't had that same level of competition. So they haven't had to really sharpen their UI to the levels the others have. So now we're seeing some of the big players getting much more active in this. And that's really raised the game, raised the bar for everyone. That's made it a lot better, quite frankly. But it can, they can do a lot more. I mean, you're coming from equities, a lot of you, you're used to trading, let's say, options on an Apple or something like that. You know, Apple shares never go away. They never expire. So you don't have to worry about this. Now you're coming in on the future side, and the underlying has an expiration date. That's a new wrinkle for a lot of you guys. And so a broker should do their job to make it above and beyond obvious exactly what future you're trading your option on. So you don't say which one you're using here, Chiefs, but I, I, I agree with you. I think in general – Brokers still have a ways to go to make it even easier. Sean, you have any thoughts on this? Because this is still clearly from the feedback we get. You think this would be a no-brainer, but this is still clearly a problem. People are still having problems with this. Any any thoughts in general on this issue? Or I, I, you, you probably echo my sentiment that a broker should do their diligence really to make it as obvious as possible for their client. Correct? I I absolutely agree with you that brokers have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure clients understand how to hedge their options positions and. And it, even that, that should be happening when they open the accounts so that there isn't there, you know, options traders need to hedge. And if you're trading index options, obviously you're going to trade the most liquid future, but it shouldn't be something you need to look for. Brokers should, should, it should be clear. So yeah, I couldn't agree more that uh, um, I, I gotta, I gotta say though, I'd, I'd like to question the client and, and, ask him what kind of system he's using. I don't know if he wants to get into that with us on a, uh, a later email, but uh, um, I think our, our, our brokers do a really good job. E-Trade does, the uh, TD Ameritrade, they do a phenomenal job at educating their clients. So um, I'd really like to know uh, um, 
what kind of system he's using where he's not seeing his, the future that he's going to trade against uh, an index position. So uh, in options. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, send it uh, in. Yeah, I totally agree. Send it in, Chief. Send us a screenshot of what you're using so we could see uh, for ourselves. But other people have written in with similar complaints. Some of it could be user error. Some of them not knowing the space as well and how to find it. Some could, like I said, coming from places like equities where they're not used to an expiring underlying. So they have to kind of come to grips with that as well. So some of it could definitely be on the user end. But I think in general, and they have gotten better. They still have a little bit of a ways to go to, to make this front and center and obvious exactly what you're doing and that's really on the broker that's that's the only place that's where you're seeing it that's where the ui is that's having you execute the trade so that's incumbent on all brokers here in the space large and small to make that process as seamless and as easy and as efficient as possible and hopefully this show has been seamless and easily and efficient and hopefully a little bit of fun and informative for you as well but unfortunately we've come to the end of another epic sojourn through the world of all things futures options. Before we go, Sean, we kind of did a deep, deep dive into all things recon, but people want to know more. They can't get enough. Like our friend, what was his name? Lewis. They want data. They want analysis. They want more information. Maybe they want a cool infographic or two, Sean. Where should they go? What should they do? Just just ask for me. Go to my – go to email me at smith at com, and I'd be happy to share any and all information – Hey, one more thing about recon that I, I didn't bring up, but there's a nice high-profile freshman class of stocks coming into the Russell 1000 index. Um, that's Uber, Lyft, Spotify. Um, just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, people knew those stocks were coming. So um, I like that. The freshman class of the Russell 1000. You're right. A lot of hot IPOs of late. Hot market caps, Uber, and I don't, think, I don't know if Beyond made it in there. If they made the cutoff date by May 10th, uh, they, if they were public by then or not. But, yeah, a lot of hot IPOs, listeners. So if you want to trade some of the hot names, there you go. And we mentioned Apple getting toppled now, Amazon, Microsoft taking the top spots there. A lot of hot things going on in the world of FTSE Russell, particularly in the next couple of weeks. Give them a follow on the Twitter machine at FTSE Russell. The place to go. All, that's where I get all this data. And then FTSE Russell.com is also the place to go. Or email Sean. Give them, a, give them an email. What's that email again, Sean, so they can bug you personally? S. Smith at FTSERussell.com. S. Smith. The man is a glutton for punishment. He's putting out his email for you. Take advantage of it, hopefully in a nice, polite, and appropriate way. <laughs> and he Absolutely. Could, Happy to help. And he couldn't join us today, but head on over to Bantix.com or QuickStrike.net, Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E.net, to sign up for Quick Strikes. You, too can kick the tires and light the fires over there and see all this good stuff like the most active contracts, how the skew change, what's going on with the vol, all that other good stuff that we do here and a heck of a lot more. Quite frankly, there's more there than we can ever talk about in a in a one hour once a week program definitely listening so kick the tires over there or if you want to see the kind of intro version see me group.com slash twifo is the place to go while you're there of course check out the reports from eric and blue a lot of great research there we'll have both of them on the show coming up soon so we'll get into all that and hopefully we'll have sean on again next week so we can get into the final nuggets for russell recon because a lot kicking in the coming week in that space and on behalf of mr smith and Mr. Nick and our friends at CME and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in your questions, all the fun stuff that you do. Keep it coming, and we'll see you back here next week for more of This Week in Futures Options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 